all of you. Um, I'm Julie Barron, and we're going to talk today about adolescent social culture and how kids connect in their social culture and how that sort of defines attitudes, behaviors, etc. And um, the first thing that I just want to say is that it is very nice to, I've been saying to people, like, I feel like I've come home. Um, I was the middle school counselor here from 2001 to 2006, and it was really the, I think it was the first year the middle school, first or second year that the middle school was even in existence. And so, um, got to see a lot of the initial growth and put a lot of time and care with this great team into developing a program here, and it's where a lot of the things I'm going to talk about today really originated for me in terms of how I work with, um, with teenagers in the context of their social lives. Um, so, okay. So, the workshop goals are really to get a better understanding of teen social culture, to learn social dynamics, how they operate, what the social roles are that kids play, and we're also going to talk about this sort of concept of being, of, of this social box, which I will illustrate for you a little bit later in the program. And, um, you know, what I'm hoping is that you get a real uh, framework and uh, sense of how these dynamics come into play so that we can figure out ways to intervene with kids and talk to them about, you know, how they're behaving, how they're interacting, what they're doing. Um, in terms of their relationships and how they're treating each other. And so we're also going to get into what defines bullying. And the reason that I think it's so important to talk about the definitions of bullying and different bullying behaviors is because it really gives us a common language when we're talking to kids about um, helping them understand what is and what isn't bullying. And if something has happened, how we help them understand that what they did, you know, with or without intent, may have caused hurt to somebody else. And uh, so we will talk about that. We are also going to, I'm also going to talk about the, um, what parents can do and in collaborating with educators, what we can all do to, to work together to help kids shape their social culture and not leave it entirely up to, to the kids to shape their social culture. Okay. <laughs> so, I am big into mindfulness. I think mindfulness is a very wonderful skill in terms of being in the present moment. But we are going to be in the present moment first for a minute in a memory of the past. So I want each of you, to, I want everyone to close their eyes. Close your eyes. I can see all of you up here, so I know whose who, eyes are open and closed. <laughs> And I want you to take yourself back to a time in your adolescence. It can be, you know, junior high, middle school, or high school, and put yourself there. And really focus on what it looked like for you. Who's there? What did it feel like? What were the sights, the sounds, the smells, the tastes, the... Everything that defined your experience at this moment in your adolescence. And just take a moment and be in it for a little bit. Okay, when you're ready, you can open your eyes, come back into your adult world, you're back, it's okay. <laughs> Why, why do we do this? Why did I ask you to do this? Yes. So we can empathize. So, we can, so you can empathize, right? Provide a context. Provide a context, exactly. Anything else? I think that so many times as adults, it's hard for us to put ourselves in our kids' shoes. And not always because we don't want to, but I think in the context of a very busy life and just going from thing to thing to thing, we don't really have time to stop and reflect on what was difficult for us growing up and what kids struggle with today. 
And, you know, it's just important to kind of take yourself there so that we can be empathic to kids and understand where they're coming from so that the, 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 you know, the guidance that we offer them and the feedback that we offer them can actually feel useful to them. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to speak for a few minutes on the adolescent brain because I think it's really important to understand what is unique about this developmental time and um, also this is a contributor around why kids behave the way they do and, and why um, you know, they respond to things in certain ways, etc. So there is a great researcher here at NIH, Jake Geed, and I don't know if any of you have seen his, his work, but he's great. And he's done these longitudinal fMRI studies where he takes pictures ongoing of teenage brains. And there are some very important outcomes that have come out of his work. One is that next to the first year in life, adolescence is the time when the brain cha changes the most. And they found that the way that the brain changes is unique and is, is not really what they originally expected or thought. So, you know, what happens is that as kids grow up through, um, you know, before adolescence, the brain, the mass of the brain and the neurons sort of, the neurons expand. And then when they get into adolescence, they go through what's like a pruning process. Okay, so if you think about how you prune a bush, you can shape it in different ways. And so the neurons they use most during adolescence stick. They stay. And the ones that they don't really need to use get kind of pruned away. And so it's a very important time in adolescence around shaping the brain. So, you know, this is not, I've had parents who come to my office and they're like, you know, is it too late? Can we, can we change? Can we help them? This is a critical time for change. And it's a critical time for experiences. So the other thing to remember is that the two parts of the brain that go head to head during adolescence is the amygdala, which is the emotional center of the brain. It's where the emotions feel are very charged from a very sort of you know, primal place. And the prefrontal cortex which is our uh, management center. It's where we uh, think through the steps of decision making. It's the metacognition, it's the um, organizing and the planning and the judgment and the thinking 10 steps ahead that we know teenagers are so good at, right? <laughs> so it's very hard, like they're feeling all of these like charged emotions and then their ability to really sort it through and think it through is not there. So, and we essentially are their prefrontal cortex during this time period. We have to help provide that on their behalf. And the last piece here is that experience shapes the brain. It actually causes neuron changes. It grows ne certain neuron connections. And so when you're experiencing healthy, adaptive, positive kinds of things, that's what's getting shaped and getting seared in there. And when you're having all kinds of horrible negative experiences, that's what's kind of getting seared in there. Now, this is not to say that things will never change after adolescence, because we're constantly changing and growing as people in terms of our, you know, our brain. But this is a really critical time in the time where there's this very dramatic kind of change going on. So it's just important you know, to have that piece as a context. All right, so I talked about how kids really define and, and experience their social interactions in the context of a culture. So what is the definition of culture? The dictionary definition of culture is the customary beliefs and social norms of a racial, religious, or social group. And the real world definition is everything we know but have never been sat down and taught. Now, we know that there are certain kids who are very savvy at understanding and picking up the nuances of all of these norms, and some of them can even verbalize them. They can tell you what they are. And other kids don't have any 
clue <laughs> what they are or how to work within them. And then, you know, there's pretty much everything in between in terms of how, how kids manage and their skill sets socially, et cetera. Okay, so when I talk to kids, when I talk to teenagers and middle schoolers about, um, you know, their social worlds, you cannot escape this word. Every single kid talks about popularity. You know, being popular, that's their frame of reference. That is the, the word that they use to define status, what kind of status they have, where they fit in the pack, the hierarchy, all of that. And so to say to them, popularity isn't important, is not, I don't, it's just not going to resonate for them. They're going to, yeah, 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 whatever, but it still is important. So I try and talk to them about positive popularity and negative popularity, and that if you are a kid who you know has social status because you've been blessed with really good social skills and that's something your brain does really well. You have a responsibility to use that power productively, wisely, and, and in a caring manner. So the positive, the definition of positive popularity is when a person has a genuine relationship with people, is able to move between relationships with different groups of people, and they don't need to hurt others to reinforce their social position. And negative popularity is when a person uses relationships to manipulate people to gain and demonstrate power over others. And what we will see in the next few slides is how this plays out, why it plays out, and the different roles that, that kids tend to play in the, in the pack. Okay. So years ago, I got connected with Rosalind Wiseman, who um, has a whole curriculum called Owning Up. And I, I've you know, done a lot of trainings with her, and I've trained with her. And if you don't know, Rosalind Wiseman wrote Queen Bees and Wannabes. And her book is what Mean Girls, the movie Mean Girls, which is like the Bible of teenage girls, you know, uh, um, for better or worse. <laughs> they use it as a frame of reference a lot, is based on. And so her whole premise is that you know, gender expectations do a lot to shape expectations and social roles. And I, this really resonated for me. And so I feel like it's really important to use this context. So some, a lot of the next few slides are from the Owning Up curriculum, um, which has been just a valuable tool in terms of training educators, parents, and kids. And I've done this work with kids, too, in terms of these classes. So I'm going to go through some of the lessons and things that I do, have done with kids. Okay, so the dictionary definition of masculinity is having qualities associated with a man. Boy world definition is good body, always want attention from girls, always competitive, has money, can't complain, never takes things too seriously, and able to discuss professional sports with authority. <laughs> so... That's what shapes the expectation for boys, right? How many of you saw the Audi commercial during the Super Bowl? Okay, for those of you who did not see the Audi commercial during the Super Bowl, let me just give you the story of this commercial. There's a, it's, it's called prom. There's a high school boy who is dateless. Doesn't have a date. And he, you know, he's a, he's a nice looking kid, but he's not like really cool in the cool crowd, right? And his mom is saying, honey, go, have, just have fun at prom. And his dad, okay, this gets into sort of parents' desire to reinforce these, these notions around masculinity. His dad tosses him keys to an Audi, brand new Audi car. It's a nice car. <laughs> and he drives to prom. And he, you can see the look on his face as he's driving, as people are calling out to him, that, like kind of making fun of him that he's by himself in the car on prom night. And he has this look of absolute and total assurance on his face. And he parks, he gets in, and he parks in the principal spot. And he marches into the prom, and he grabs the prom queen to the dismay of the king who did not like that. 
and he kisses her. This very bold move. And the next thing it cuts to, you see the, the king of the prom, whatever, kind of coming after him. And the next thing you see is him driving away in the Audi with the hugest smile on his face and the biggest black eye you've ever seen. <laughs> he withstood a punch because he's tough like that, you know. So this is an example of how in our culture we reinforce these notions of masculinity for boys and men. And we're going to go through another exercise that's going to, you know, show us a little bit more about how this works <coughs> I don't want to leave out the girls because they had equal play also during Super Bowl commercials. Did anybody see the Mercedes commercial with, what's her name, Kate? Who is it? You know. Thank you. Kate Upton. I knew you guys were out. I knew that the, the senior boys in the room know. Okay. So the whole premise of that commercial, it was a car commercial, but I don't know why it was a car commercial, because they didn't really feature the car. It was, you know, Kate Upton in her Daisy Duke shorts and a very busty tank top, and they're washing the car, and it's just this very sort of sexualized, this is how, you know, women should be kind of commercial. And there really wasn't much more to it, to be honest with you. There wasn't even like a good story to it, not like the Audi story. That was a pretty good story. But um, it was just really about the sexuality, and that was it. Which brings us to girls. So femininity, the dictionary definition is the quality or nature of the female sex. Girl world definition is the right body, guys like you, in control, not uptight, and smart enough to get people to do what you want, especially without them noticing. And we know that there are plenty of girls who are very good at this, and some who are not so good at it. Okay, so this is a lesson from owning up that I have done a lot of times with different groups of kids. And I'm going to do it with you guys, so I'm going to need your input. And this is called The Box. This is about Girl World Box and Boy World Box. So we'll start with the boys. And um, this is what I say to kids when I do this. Okay. What does a boy have to look like? Act like, be like. Have you done this? Have you done it? Do you remember? Okay. Um, Dacron was here when I was in middle school. So. All right. Um, what does a boy have to look like, act like, be like in order for people to respect him? Raise your hands. I want to hear. I want to hear what you think. Yeah. Tom Brady. Okay, but what about Tom Brady makes him so appealing? Athletic, charming. Athletic, charming, attractive. What else? Just call it out. Courageous. What? Confident. Tough. Tough. Muscular. Muscular. And makes it look easy, too. And, and without any effort, right? Makes it look Doesn't like he's not even try. trying. What else? Anything else? Funny. Funny. Comfortable in his own clothes. Comfortable in his own clothes. And what are his clothes? Well, at least appearing to be comfortable. Yeah, appearing to be comfortable, right. Has to have the latest clothes. Latest clothes. Has to have the right the style, right? Clothes. There's the a sneakers. certain style. Right. With manners. What? Manners. With manners? Maybe. And, and fits in. And fits in. And he's smart. He's successful. The adults want them to have manners, but if you ask this question yeah, to the kids, right. no. I'm not sure if that would be on the top five or six. Okay, so let's see. Let's, these are the most common answers that boys, that I've done this with just boys and also mixed groups of boys and girls. And so this is really what the teenagers say. And the beauty of this exercise, by the way, is that this is the way that kids define for us what their cultural norms are. These are the rules that they are operating from. 
And there's no way for us to know and it's, unless they tell us. And what's nice about this is that you can go from community to community to community with different cultures, different socioeconomic, you know, pat differences, whatever it is, and the kids will tell you what's important. And it looks different in different places. But these are sort of the common responses that I'm going to show you. Okay. Gets girls confident. You guys are on track with that one. Athletic, in control, has money, which means he can have nice things. Risk taker, but doesn't get caught. Good style, the right gear. Don't take things too seriously, so you guys talked about that. Smooth talker, somebody said charming. Good in school, but not stressed about it, which is good plays to the piece about not seeming to, you know, put much effort into things. Right? Okay. Next question. What does a boy look like, act like, have to be like, if people don't respect him, if, he's, if he is not respected by his peers? What does that look like? Doesn't care. What else? Just shout it out. Uptight. Uptight. Withdrawn. Withdrawn. Poor social skills. Poor social skills. Sensitive. Not Sensitive. The not the athlete. Not athletic. Clumsy. 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 Scrawny. Studious, like really, and try so hard, right? So don't, aren't like geeks and nerds cool these days? Well, we hope we hope so. I, I mean, mean, we like to think so. Sometimes. I think that they they are when they certainly when they grow up to be adults, then but not always, <laughs> right? Not always. And again, I mean, this is from community to community. Kids define this a little bit differently, and so there's room for different kinds of definitions. So here's here are the typical responses. Tries too hard. Like a girl, gay, fag. And when I do this exercise, by the way, with kids, I tell them to give me the words that they use with each other. Because I want them to I want I want us to be able to define what is their real context, where they're coming from. And you know, there's a lot of guidelines I do before I do this exercise and talk about what it's for and the purpose and all of that. But it's there's gonna be a lot of language up here, and it's it's because it's this is what's real for them. Poor, too serious, fat or bad skin, too sensitive, not into sports, won't take risks, weak or slow, wrong style, not into or too into video games, which um, Ed Spector may have talked about sort of that balance this morning, and can't take a joke. Right? Guys are always trying to play pranks on each other, right? To see what? Reaction. Who, right. Reaction. Who's gonna react and who can take it? How tough are you? Someone said tough. The two main things that boys are constantly trying to prove is that they're tough and that they're heterosexual. <laughs> In adolescent social culture, those are the things that a lot of the behaviors are trying to reinforce and demonstrate. And that's why when they hurt each other, they use names like, you know, wuss, mama's boy, fag. They're, take, they're trying to take away the, their sense of masculinity. All right, so now, any questions so far about... Boys? All right, let's move to girls. Okay. What do girls look like, act like, have to be like for lots of people to like them? Sexual. Sexual. Social. How do you know they're social? They're friendly. friendly. Skinny. Skinny. Confident. Pretty, confident. They wear the right clothes. Wear the right clothes. Great hair. Great hair. <laughs> hair is a big one. Okay. And what else? Boys like them. Boys like them. Smart. Smart. Not too smart. 
but not too smart. It can't show that it's like any, you know, effortless. It's got to be effortless. What else? And they have a certain status. Like they can, they can uh, control their power. Okay, so what all of these things give them status, and they use the status, everybody knows that they have power. Right? Okay. Anything else? All right. Here are the most common responses for girls. Pretty. Popular, meaning you, everybody sort of knows who you are, like in a good way. Thin, but the right curves. Because you can't just be like, you know, bored. That doesn't work. Nice hair. Athletic, but not bulky, and not better than the boys. Right? Not what? Okay. <laughs> Not better than the boys. Oh, okay. <laughs> Confident, money, right style, in control, get good grades, but not too smart. You guys are good. You got it. Like, I think you got all of them. All right. What does a girl look like, act like, have to be like, to not, when she's not liked and she's not valued by her peers? What, are the, what do you think the words are not that stylish. kids use? Say it again. Not stylish. Not stylish. Bad, fat, fat, nerdy, bad skin. Nerdy, bad skin quiet. Insecure, bad quiet, too smart, too smart tries bad too hair, hair, tries too hard, <laughs> introverted, too confident. Too confident. Butch. Butch. Good one. Boys don't like her. Boys don't like her. Okay, let's see what's up here. Uptight, wrong style, fat, cold or prude. You know sexuality is going to get into the mix here too. Slut, dependent, like too needy, clingy, too masculine, butch, lesbian, bitch. This can be in or out. Mm -hmm. Dependent. Depending on how you carry, I guess, your bitchiness. <laughs> like, it can be something that's a positive or it can be something that's a negative. Poor, wrong hair, bad skin, tries too hard, follows, or copies. How many of you have sixth grade girls or interact on a regular basis with sixth grade girls? <laughs> All the middle school staff, raise your hand. The most common social dilemma of sixth grade girls, I don't know if you guys find this, this has been my experience, is when they're like, she's copying me. Oh my, I just got this new purse and so-and-so came and she has the same purse. <laughs> it's all about, be, you know, so, I mean, think of the, the, this dilemma, especially, this is especially true in middle school. You have to be enough like everybody else but not exactly like everybody else. And, you, and it depends on where you fall on the status as to how acceptable and okay it is for you to, to copy or to have something close, closely you know, connected to what somebody else has. All right, now. I want to talk about how this box works and the importance of the box. So when I do this with kids, I say to them, it doesn't matter where you fall in this picture. It doesn't matter if you're smack in the middle of the box. It doesn't matter if you're way out on outside the box, if you're on the edges, if you're in but not too in. It doesn't matter. What matters is how important is this to you? Because if this is super important to you, it's going to shape all of your thoughts, attitudes, feelings, and behaviors. This is the reality of how the hierarchy functions and, and how the norms play out, but kids can decide how important it is to them or not. And how desperate they are to be in a certain place or not. Does that make sense? So this is what causes bullying. This is how bullying happens. 
It's people trying to get in the box, push someone out of the box, stay in the box, and proving your loyalty to the people in the center of the box. There's, you know, there's a lot of ways kids try and do that. Some kids are really, really good at not placing too much importance on this box. You know, they're aware of it. They know, they sort of know how it all plays out, but it's just not so important to them. That's, I would say, is the ideal. Yeah. Do you talk about ways to help kids place less importance when they're in the box? Yeah, I mean, and there's a lot of ways that you can do that, and, and that's a great point. So the question was, do I talk to kids about how to place less importance on the box? The way to do that, it, it, the short answer, and we'll get to it a little bit more in the presentation, is you have to take them back to their values. You have to help them understand who they are and who, who they are at their core. And you want, I mean, I always think the goal is to help kids authentically grow into who they are and, and be okay with that and accept their flaws as well as the things they're really good at and work with what they have. You know, it's hard to do and they're not ready to do it in middle school or even high school, but it's a process and it's, so it's not a quick fix, but it's like these ongoing conversations to answer your question about, well, what's important to you? And are you acting in a way or treating people in a way that matches what's important to you? Which stems also from family values, how people, how parents um, communicate the values at home. You know, I always say if you ask a kid, what are the three most important values in your family? They should know. I mean, they should sort of have a sense, and it should be fairly close to what you think they would answer. So this is this is sort of what we have often called the moral compass. You know. <clears throat> You want that to help them work on finding and regulating their moral compass. So that's where they operate from. So that if something happens that goes against what they feel is important, it's not going to feel good to them. You want that to be the driving force around kids' you know, decision making. So when you, when you ask the question about how do you help them not make this so important, it's almost like turning from what's all external to helping them look a little bit more inward and, and thinking from an, an internal place. So when I work with kids you know, in therapy, and all they, their, their behaviors are all guided by what's going on around them and what everybody else is thinking and saying, um, what I try and do is help them know themselves. Well, what did you think about that? Like, how was that for you? Just you, just you, not, let's just, I know all of those social norms are in play and they're important to you and everything else, but just for a second, ask yourself if it was how you felt about it. And a lot of times I will ask kids if they've done something with an internal motivation or an external motivation. So, you know, it's okay, like, whatever you're doing, but, like, ask yourself and be honest with yourself. Is that because you wanted to do it or because of other reasons outside of you? And I think that's one of the best ways to help regulate the balance about this box not becoming hugely important. Any other questions about the box? Yes. Chris, it, it, when you're saying that, it's very helpful, but um, the balance, you know, as a parent, I remember being told, don't care what everybody else thinks. And so there is this balance of presenting, think from within, and balancing that you do care what everybody else thinks, but still and yet you live with yourself. And so I think that's a hard thing, though, because if you unilaterally just say, oh, don't care, you know, that never worked with me. <laughs> I, I, thank you for saying that, because you're right. If you tell kids, you shouldn't care about that. Right. Really? You're disregarding. I mean, the reason we do this is because this is their real world. This is the real world they live in. You have to operate from what's real. 
You can't just pretend it doesn't exist. And the kids who don't have a good sense of how these things play out are the ones who are having a lot of trouble. Jonah, you want to say something? Yeah, yeah I think there's a time when there's so much shame And, 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 you know, to your point, it's not the answer of, like, where you get. It's, it's the process. It's just having these conversations ongoing. It's validating that this is a hard context to operate in. It is. It's really hard. And, of course, it's important to you. I also find myself, and I don't know if this is good or not, but I find myself often analyzing the behavior of another kid that he, my son might complain about. But I also get the chance to say, think about what their reason for doing that. That's they right. probably are jealous of you, and that's why they're spreading these rumors. So maybe we think about what is it that's making them jealous, and how can you approach that with them? I, I don't know if it's too much information. Well, no. I mean, look, it, it, I think what you're speaking to is helping kids understand their own behaviors and their own um, what's going on for them in a larger context. You know? And... Kids, you know, we all know those kids who are um, very, very much operate just from their own perspective, and they don't, they don't either have the ability or the wherewithal, or they don't just don't think to take other perspectives into consideration when they're assessing a whole, the whole picture of something. And that's also really important in terms of helping kids talk things through from various perspectives. It's not what's real or what's true or false. It's, well, here are all the perspectives, and so let's see how it's all playing out. Yes? I guess the piece of this, listening to this, that I find difficult is the piece of, as you were saying, minimizing the importance of the box, but at the same time, balancing that. I mean, I know with my child, I'm like, dealing with a lot of the kids here, with also having an understanding of the box and want to be in the box as well. I mean, to respect that, that becomes the over, you know, over the driving goal of their lives, but. <coughs> That is their conflict. And we are just helping them negotiate a conflict. There's not an answer. Do you know what I mean? That's what I'm saying. It's not about getting them to believe the box is important. That's not what this is for. This is really about how, what you just said, helping them understand the reality of the context that they function in and getting them to begin to think about the pros, the cons of, you know, in behaving in such a way that, well, how much of this did I take into consideration when I made fun of this kid today? Or um, did I do that because I don't like the kid or because I was trying to please one of my friends? You just want them, you want the wheels turning. You know, they're not going to come to answers at this stage in their life, in their lives. They're just, they're not there yet. But this is about getting the wheels to turn. It's about a thought process, you know, and it's about acknowledging and validating the reality of what they live in every single day. Yes. And it seems to me, too, that it's not going to change. All that's up there has pretty much been like that for a really long mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. You know, it could be the 1940s, the 1960s, the new millennium. So it's like the conflict doesn't ever go away because it's not like, well, by your behavior, you're going to change the box. You're right. not. That's right. It's like it's like office politics for adults. Right. <laughs> That's right. It's, There's a box for adults. There is a box for adults. No question. <laughs> yeah, but the thing about office politics for adults is you got to know the politics. You got to know the undercurrents, but you don't have to play it. That's right. You, you have, have to, to know. Th this is, okay, so... One of the, the things that we used to talk about when I was the counselor, middle school counselor here is that this is the definition of the landscape. You have to know what the landscape looks like. You need a map if you're going to be able to navigate. So that's what you're speaking to, which I think is, is right on, is that this is about navigating, helping kids navigate through and avoid as many pitfalls as possible 
right? Learn from their mistakes. Kids are all going to get caught up in this in, in one way or another. And our job is to help them understand it and navigate it and move into adulthood in such a way that, you're right, adults do get sort of trapped in some of this, but we also as adults have a lot more control about the kind of environments we put ourselves in and who we surround ourselves by and also feeling competence in a, in a specific thing that we do. You know, I often say to, to high schoolers, this is the only time in your life where you're ever going to be required to be good at everything. We live in a specialized world. We don't all try and be our own attorneys and our own mechanics and our own, you know, dentists and our own. There are, people are specialized. And, but so the goal is to help kids grow up and find their authentic selves and their skills and their strengths and do something that feels important to them. Did you have something to say, and then I'll get to her. direction, which is great, to a sort of inclusive, you know, whoever you are, it's okay, and you're, you know, human beings, by virtue of being a human being, are deserving of dignity. And that's what we want our kids to know, that every human being, regardless of whatever the differences are, deserves dignity, to be treated with dignity. Because the social anxieties of middle school are so strong and people are so worried about being different because it's developmental, I think from a developmental standpoint, this is still very powerful for them. And some are better than others. I think actually when you kind of move more into high school, there's more of an acceptance of people coming out if they're, you know, if young people are, are really finding that they are, you know, coming to terms with the fact that they're gay, that they're homosexual, or they felt it for a long time and they could never say anything. I think high school is, tends to be a much more, generally speaking, accepting environment because they're just ready in a different way. Middle school is different. It's, it's a very unique time. Uh, oh, wait, I want to get to Hope. And then, um, Jenny, go ahead. And I'm, I'm very... Um, I feel very privileged to have followed in your footsteps and the, and the things that you, Thank you put in place we are still using and, and tweaking. Um, what I find is that at the end of the day, empathy is so important. And it's and it's because this, you know, what you're putting up there, the kids inside the box, it's a struggle, such a struggle to stay in. And 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 they when they can and sometimes they do get that they have social IQ, social skills. And when I say, would you want to be outside? They're like, no. I'm like, so can you imagine what it might be like for somebody? It's, it's this getting down to kids having to survive middle school together. Yeah. Having that empathy is what I really, really try. And not, not ignoring the landscape, but having empathy that you're going through it with others. Right. No, I, and you know what? In, in, in an ideal world, 
everybody would have that kind of empathy. The kids would all have that kind of empathy. And everybody could sit right where they are, wherever they are, in or in context to this box, and everybody would just treat each other nicely. There wouldn't be a box. There wouldn't be a box. There wouldn't be a distinction. Well, there could be a distinction, but without judgment. It's the... Right. I think the box exists because of the developmental... That's right. That's true. That's very true. Like, developmentally speaking, some kids are a little bit more ahead than others, and, and it, some of that is, plays out for that reason. But, you know, it's not about where you are in the box or out of the box. It's the judgment that goes along with it. And that if you've been judged in a particular way, there's this unspoken um, norm that you're to be treated in a particular way, for better or worse. Jenny? I think one of the challenges being an educator and a person in you know, a classroom is that you have to be able point is so well taken and it's uh, I'm going to get to some of that in the next Great. couple of slides because that's absolutely correct. Okay, you know what? I'm going to move on because there is I jammed a lot of stuff into this workshop. This is like usually a 3-hour workshop. All right. So, I'm not going to go through these one by one. But essentially, oops, sorry. <laughs> Essentially, th this is a framework, and this is again from Queen Bees and Wannabes from the work that Roz has done, but um, these are the different roles that people tend to play. And helping kids understand what role they're playing and why they're playing it is, is again, helps them to be thoughtful about their part in their social context and what they bring to the table, what they offer, what they contribute, what they may be, you know, um, contributing that's negative or positive. And so these are all of the, the different roles. These are the ones for, for girls and these are the ones for boys. And it's my understanding that the PowerPoint will be up on the website, so if people want to go back and read in more detail, um, you know, you can do that. So I want to move on to the bullying behaviors and then get to some of the interventions, parents, par parents and schools working together piece. So we are very close to the end here. And I, is it okay if I take like five more minutes? Okay. Um, so when I talk to kids about bullying and I teach them what bullying is, I have used this model in terms of breaking it down and defining very specifically how things play out in each of these different categories. And, you know, kids are pretty well versed in the first two. The physical aggression and the verbal aggression is pretty clear, and they, they, can, they can see that concretely. And a lot of the, you know, some of the other ones are much more nuanced. Now, I can get into another three hours on technology and social media and how kids interact online and cyberbullying and everything else, but it's another, unfortunately, it's another, it's a different presentation. Um, so, but this is how it all plays out. And they need to understand what it looks like. What is social aggression? You know, how does somebody with power manipulate the context of things so that they can achieve a particular outcome for another person? You know, all of these things are really important for kids to understand. And I think when we, when we again, as adults, when we have common language to use to talk about this with each other and with the kids, it makes a huge difference. This is how I explain to kids what's the difference between bullying and normal conflict. If the behavior is repeated, 
not necessarily by the same person. If there's an unequal level of feelings, another one, another, in other words, somebody, the person who's dishing it out is like, oh, it's just being funny, it was just a joke. But the other person on the receiving end is, does not feel that way. Unequal level of feelings. And the other is an imbalance of power, which can be physical, it can be, you know, um, most of the time it's social. Who has the social power and the leverage? And I want to speak to just this unequal level of feelings for a second, specific to boys. So if you think about the box and the fact that boys are, are feeling pressure to prove how tough they are all the time, what that what that does is it traps them into responding in an honest way about how they feel about something. And I have had rooms full of boys, and I ask them, because the kids will say, but so-and-so was fine with it. They laughed. Right. And then I say, how many of you in the room, how many boys have ever felt hurt or embarrassed or you know, humiliated or just upset and haven't shown it or expressed it to anyone. How many hands do you think go up? All of them. All of them. So I'm like, you know what? You can't use the excuse that, well, they laughed along. Because, of course, they're going to laugh along, but that's not really how they feel. We can't assume that's really how they feel. And then they get it. They're like, oh, yeah. And I also talk about the repeated behavior. So all the kids know which kids. They'll say, but I only did it once. Yeah, but you know that Jimmy walks down the hall and three other people bully him along the way. You know that. So you're contributing to a repeated experience of the person being victimized. That counts. The reason to know how to talk about all of this stuff is because accountability, the reason that the curriculum is called owning up, is because we need to help kids feel accountable for their role in whatever, and not because we're just blaming or characterizing. And I've always said, I think there are very few kids who are bullies. I don't really believe in bullies characterologically. Kids make choices in the context of their social culture. And we have to help them be accountable for those choices. Okay, so... Basically, I'm not going to read all of this, but the research says that the way to tackle this, that there obviously is a lot of harm done by bullying, and the way to tackle this is from a comprehensive standpoint, a climate perspective. This is not the administrators handling a situation. This is getting the kids' voices involved. This is getting the parents' voices involved. This is getting, this is, has to be collaborative and comprehensive. There has to be a discipline policy that works. There has to be a positive reinforcement system where kids know when they're doing well. There has to be a way that kids get in on the problem solving. There has to be a way that parents support conversations about what's right and wrong and about, you know, accountability. It, you cannot miss any one level. So, what Jenny had said before about parents having their own sense of the box, I have never, ever, in all of these years, I've been working with kids and teenagers and parents for 20 years, and I've never met a parent who really is ill-intended. Parents are doing the best they can. They really are, genuinely, doing the best they can. It may not always fit our standard of what we think should be the best they can, but they are. They're not trying to do things to hurt their kids. But we have to be aware as parents and adults where we remember fitting in the social box when we were growing up, how invested we are in our kids being friends with certain other kids, getting invited to certain parties, having, you know, like, because our influence and our messages to our kids also feed all this stuff. So we have to be honest with ourselves about what's real for us and how important this all is. How important is it to live in a certain neighborhood or drive a certain car or, you know, go to certain parties or... And I'm not saying it's right or wrong. All I'm saying is that an awareness of how much importance we as adults place on this has a lot to do with how we guide our kids through the landscape. 
that makes sense. I think that's what you were speaking to, Jenny. Um, so the other piece is, what is the one thing that pa parents, adults, educators that have said to their kids, and I've caught myself saying it to my kids too, and then I'm like, oh, wait, 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 I don't, I don't mean that. What's the one piece of advice that we are so quick to offer to kids when they've been hurt? Get over it. Get over it. <laughs> ignore it. Ignore Just ignore them. <laughs> Doesn't work. Because ignoring to them feels powerless. Yeah. And they're already feeling powerless. Now, I've talked to kids about strategic ignoring, which is, you know, a, making a decision to ignore and letting somebody know, like, I don't need this shit from you, basically, or I'm not going to take this, or I'm not going to stand here and let you do this to me and walk away, different from this sort of brushed off, just ignore them. Let me just finish getting through because we're, we're running over at this point. Um, and it's really important to hear the kids' perspectives. The, the only tool that you have when your kids get old enough to be out of the house on their own, you cannot get in their heads and follow them around. The only thing, the best tool that you have for them, with them, is your relationship with them. And it is a very delicate balance, as we all know, between limits and boundaries and open conversations. How do I set limits but not sound permissive? How do, it's all this finding the right balance. If you need to be able to have conversations, open conversations with your kids, they need to know that if something's going on, they can come to you. And they're not going to either be dismissed or um, that your, your response isn't going to be so reactive that it that it's like, turns them off and they can't talk. So listening to your kids is really important, understanding their um, perspective. And we talked already about how to connect family values and to their values and friendship. They need to explore what are your values and friendship. And if your experience matches what your values are, you're in great shape. But if your experience with your friends doesn't match what those values are, you need to like reevaluate your friendships. The other is to find the balance between coaching, supporting, and intervening. If a kid is in, has either tried to handle things multiple times on their own and it's not working, and it depends on the age of the kid too and, and judging sort of your, what your child can handle, or they're at risk, like their safety is at risk, it's really important for adults to step in and not let it play out so far down the line that somebody's going to get hurt. The other piece is collaborating with educators. And I have always said that kids' lives are like a puzzle. We all have a piece of the puzzle. And if we don't talk to each other and put the pieces together, you're never going to know what that picture looks like. So it is important for educators and parents to work together and not see it as this is something the parent should do or this is something that the administrator should do. No, it's a team effort. And these are the pieces of the team. So here are the resources. And I hope today was enjoyable for you guys. And have a great afternoon. Enjoy your lunch.